Well, good morning and welcome to the third in the DMH Stallard Family Law webinar series. Um, my name is Samantha Jago and I will be your host today. I am a family law partner and mediator and work for DMH Stallard. Our topic today is addressing how the pandemic has affected family finance law issues. So by way of example, pension report, the ability to pay maintenance, um, alternative to court, how is court being conducted and so forth. There are three speakers for you today. The first speaker is myself. And as I said, my name is Samantha Jago and I specialize in family law. And I'm going to be um, just touching upon the concerns um, that I'm experiencing that clients have due to the pandemic and finances and how to resolve them, alternatives to going to court and other ways we might find to resolve matters um, whilst we're in this time of uncertainty. The second speaker today is Ben Fernley, who is a family law barrister with 29 Bedford Row. He also sits as a private FDR judge, is a trained mediator, and is also a deputy district judge. He will be talking about variations to agreements. Can you vary them? If you can't pay, what you should do if somebody's not paying you? Whether the pandemic might be considered an event that could set aside an agreement or order that you may have. Our final speaker today is Caroline Bayliss, and she's an actuary with Excalibur Actuaries. And this is a boutique firm that specializes in pension sharing and pension reports upon divorce. And she's going to be talking to us today about the pandemic's effect upon pension valuations, the different types of pensions there are, how they might be dealt with, and what effect that the pandemic may have upon pension sharing and so forth. Today's webinar lasts for approximately one hour. Um, and each speaker will be speaking for around 10 to 15 minutes. During the webinar, you have the opportunity to raise questions, so please do submit them online. When we have finished speaking, and all three of us have finished speaking, we'll endeavour to answer those questions. If we're not able to answer all of those questions, then we will put together a question and answer pamphlet or leaflet, which we will publish on our website. If you would rather that your question was kept private, then please let us know. We will not publish the answer on our website if we haven't been able to answer the question, and we will endeavour to come back to you individually. There is a recording of today's webinar, which will be uploaded onto our website at the beginning of next week, together with the slides and the content that you will see today appearing on the screen, and also the question and answer pamphlet. As I've said, this is the third in our family law webinar series, and we do have recordings and reels from our other two webinars on the website now. So if you have missed those webinars, please do go and have a look at them, have a look at the materials as we have had some really good speakers and the content is very relevant to what is happening today in the world. So without further ado, um, I'm just going to move on to um, my, speak, uh, my talk at the moment. So just coming on to common concerns that um, I'm coming across as a practitioner. A lot of people are concerned or my concerns, whether or not they should initiate divorce proceedings at all, or whether they should wait until some later date to see how the pandemic pans out. Another thing that a lot of clients are concerned about is whether they should put on hold negotiating their financial settlement. Understandably, an awful lot of people have um, concerns about this because they may have lost their job or the job might be under threat. They might have taken a salary cut where they can't find employment when they thought they would be able to do so. They might have an interest in a business or shares that seem that their value has plummeted um, and so on. So they might be saying, I don't really want to tie myself into something now that would either be a poor deal for me because I would be under, the assets would be undervalued or because I'm going to be asked to have to commit to something that I don't think that I might be able to fulfill if I do lose my job or I continue with this um, depressed income. Other concerns is whether or not parties still have to go to court and if the courts are open and if they are how they're operating. Can parties revisit their financial agreement given the pandemic um, by either setting it aside or varying it? And Ben Fernley from 29 Bedford Row will be addressing that. Another concern is that the, um, your former spouse may have stopped paying you or is threatening to reduce what they're paying you or stop it altogether. And there might be a court order there or not. What can you do? Again, Ben Fernley will be addressing this. And as I've touched upon, there may be difficulty in valuing assets. Um, I must say that this um, webinar is aimed really at people that have been married and separating and is not really aimed at people that have been cohabiting. If you have any questions that touch upon these concerns that we are talking about here, please do raise these questions with us and we'll come back to you separately. But the focus today 
is pretty much on um, spouses separating. So moving on to the next slide. I think that it's important as solicitors that we always try to find a way to be creative during these um, periods of unrest so that we can provide stability and reassurance to our clients, but perhaps don't make them feel that being bulldozed or forced into a resolution that they're uncomfortable with due to uncertainty. Now, we as practitioners will be aware of a deed of separation. It can be used by um, former spouses or it can be used by communities, which regulates um, what should happen um, to their assets or financially upon their separation. A lot of people, and as practitioners, we generally use these when people aren't sure if they want to initiate divorce proceedings at this stage, but might want to do it at a later date. Um, but I think this is something we should maybe be turning to our minds to now as practitioners to say, well, we do have an uncertain economic climate. Perhaps they can be used now as a temporary measure until such time as we have a little bit more certainty as to the economy. And so it might be that we put in the, those sorts of orders what will happen now. So we make sure that there's private uh, financial provision and security for parties now. But we might put in there some review clause, say, for 12 months time or 18 months time to see how the economy is at that time with a view then to formalising matters by initiating divorce proceedings and entering into a much far, um, a much longer financial agreement that is permanent. Um, I do like to um, these expression because they can be tailor made to each party's um, personal set of circumstances, which is why I think we should be considering this in the current economic climate. Um, as always, make sure that if you have a deed of separation, it's not just some homemade agreement, that you have had um, legal advice, there's been proper disclosure, and that um, it is fair and reasonable in the provisions. Um, courts are persuaded by it, but if it's manifestly unfair or some of this criteria has not, not been met, they might look to set parts of it aside um, or vary it. So deed of separation is something we should be thinking about. Moving on to the next slide. Um, with the moment, we are in a slightly strange environment that courts are operating, but they're operating remotely in most cases. I have had actually one case where they insisted the parties came in, but as a rule, they are operating remotely. And that means that courts are often used platforms similar to Zoom to have um, virtual hearings or they're using the telephone. But as practitioners, we should always be looking at alternatives to going to court. Now, I know quite a lot of practitioners are watching this, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about each of the alternatives to court. Direct agreement is where the parties agree and that they come to you and you draft up the agreement as a solicitor. Solicitors negotiating. Um, this won't change now because most solicitors negotiate via telephone or letter, so we can carry on in that manner um, despite the pandemic. Mediation, where an impartial third party meets with both parties with a view to um, helping them resolve the legal issues that flow from their separation. Now, I have been involved in quite a few of these um, during the pandemic, and similar to how the court are approaching this, this has been conducted, in my experience, by Zoom, and within Zoom having breakout rooms so that um, you can, if you're helping your um, client, you can go off into a breakout room with your client or the mediator go into breakout rooms with the clients and then bring them back. So it can still be conducted. So it shouldn't, the, the pandemic shouldn't put you off potentially pursuing that. Um, collaborative law and roundtable meetings, so where you're, where the lawyer and the client uh, sit around the table um, normally um, with the other lawyer and party on the other side to try to um, reach agreement. Again, this can be done virtually with breakout rooms and so forth. So there's no reason why that can't go ahead. Private FDRs, arbitration, early neutral evaluation. Early neutral evaluation is the same as private FDs, ours, but this is where you hire a judge, as it were, to assist in reaching a resolution and reaching an agreement for the parties. Again, these can be conducted um, virtually. Um, and what I would say with any one of these options is this, make sure that you and your client have the technology, that you're familiar with the technology before entering into any of these alternatives so that when you do, um, if you are going to conduct these virtually, that you're both comfortable with the technology and you can sort of get on with it in a relaxed way. Um, there's always the need to balance the time and costs against the outcome you're trying to achieve. Achieve. And a lot of people are put off from private FDRs or uh, arbitration because they think, well, I've got to pay for a private judge in a venue. But I think some of these options are actually cost neutral when you think about how long it takes to get a case to go through court. Um, and when you think about the potential um, time involved and other experts that need to be brought in, this is where leapfrogging the process, having somebody who's dedicated to the case, specialised in family law, 
and can help the family. So um, these autism calls are available and in my experience, actually quite successful. Clients are relaxed because they're in their own home. If they need some time out, they can take some time out in the comfort of their own home. So they are really proving successful. So that brings me to the end of my presentation um, regarding um, the concerns and the alternatives to court. But I thought that would be good to have, just ask some questions and get some feedback so that we understand how these issues are actually affecting our clients. So according to the Institute for Fiscal Studies, by May um, 2020, the percentage of people in jobs was what percent lower than predicted before COVID-19. So if you can vote on screen, please do. If you don't have that facility, if you wait a moment, I'll come back to you with the results. So I'm going to take the um, opportunity to vote now myself, and I'm just going to take um, a little bit of time to wait for the poll to come in. Okay, so um, we have had the votes in and um, the 4% of you, sorry, 50% of you thought it would be 4% lower, 25% of you thought it was 2% lower and 25% of you thought it was 6% lower. So if we move on to the next slide and we can see those results. The answer is A, um, the number of jobs was 4% lower um, than predicted. Um, household earnings were 9% lower and, a, and there was um, income was 8% lower. So we can see that these issues are having a real knock on effect on the clients we represent every day. And that's why we need to be cautious and imaginative when advising them as to a financial settlement. Moving on to the next poll question. According to the Institute of Fiscal Studies, the number of households paying their mortgage rent and council tax was how much lower than anticipated for May 2020. Again, please do vote online if you can. If you can't, the answer will be uh, revealed in a minute. So A, 14% for mortgages, 11% for rent and 9% for council tax. I voted myself. Um, B, 16% for mortgages, 13% for rent and 11% for council tax. Or C, 12% for mortgages, 9% for rent and 7% for council tax. So again, I'm just going to take a moment to await the poll results coming in. Right, so um, the pretty split um, result here, 14, uh, so 33% have gone for option A, 47% have gone for option B, and 20% have gone for option C. So if we can move on to the next slide, which shows these results, the answer is A, non-payment household bills um, were 14% less, 11% less, um, and 9% less um, with regards to those uh, to mortgage rental and council tax payments. And Surprisingly, poorer households are falling behind more readily on council tax and utility bills. But non-payment of mortgages spread evenly across different um, backgrounds. And this is something we need to be mindful of as practitioners because mortgage holidays don't stop that payment having to be paid, it simply defers it. And we often have a negotiation of people saying they want mortgage holidays or that they want to go into interest only mortgage, but we have to think about the long-term impact that might have on the family, but also the ability of families to actually meet maintenance um, obligations if they're struggling just to meet their basic everyday living costs. Okay, moving on to the final poll question. In a poll of 1,500 adults by Hachi Personal Finance, what is the top activity that has brought Brits joy during um, 2020? So a lot of us have actually seen that there have been some benefits from working from home or not having the commute and so forth. So here, um, what brought them joy? Was it spending time with extended family, financial security, or spending time with their partner or spouse? So again, I'm gonna take the time to vote myself and await the results. So interestingly, there is a split result to here. 44% um, thought it was spending time with extended family and 56% thought it was spending time with their partner. But nobody thought that financial security was something that people enjoyed. So if we actually go on to the results now, um, they in fact enjoy spending time with their extended family the most. Financial security, interestingly, comes in second. And I can only presume that's because people are not paying for um, commutes, um, you know, 
and train fares and tube fares and petrol and so forth. But interestingly, spending time with someone's partner or spouse comes in bottom there. So there is still work for us uh, practitioners out there. Anyway, thank you for listening to me. I'm now going to hand over to Ben Fernley, who will take you through his presentation. Thank you. Right. Uh, just a little bit about me. My name is Ben Fernley. I'm a barrister from 29 Bedford Row. Uh, when I'm not barristering, I am a mediator. Uh, I act as a collaborative lawyer as well. Uh, and I also sit as a deputy district judge. So I've seen um, the impact of COVID really from, from all sides, both from within uh, the bar and also sitting as a judge. And what I'm going to be talking to you about today is the impact of COVID-19 on uh, family finances generally. In other words, financial remedy proceedings, proceedings arising from divorce, either uh, cases which are currently before the courts or cases which have previously been before the courts and there's an ongoing order or cases which were very recently before the courts and parties have settled just prior to COVID and are wondering perhaps if there's anything they can do about it now in this changing landscape. Uh, the nature of my talk today, it's, it's going to be relatively brief and it's going to be relatively broad and hopefully not too technical, but um, what it isn't going to do is deal with anything outside the economic aspect of COVID-19. I appreciate that COVID-19 has ramifications far wider than just economic. People are losing their lives as a result of this illness. But this talk is really just about the economic impact. And I think we all know that COVID-19 has had a very significant impact on the economy. We might not all be aware of the figures, and I'm going to give you some now without wanting to throw numbers at you, to give you an ex uh, perhaps a taste of the impact this disease has had. In January 20, before COVID became wide, widely known, the FTSE was valued at 7,400, just a figure, 7,400. On the 23rd of March, it was trading at below 5,000. Uh, the last time the index was that low was in August 2009, in the midst of the banking crisis. That's a very significant drop. The last time the index dropped as much as it did was in 1987. So the impact on the economy cannot really be overstated. There's been some recovery. Uh, we're now trading at approximately 5,900. But that's still a lot lower than where we were 12 months ago. Now, I think a lot of people feel that those figures can seem somewhat abstract and unconnected to the real world. But the economy has a very real impact on people's lives. People are losing their jobs. Uh, people's companies are closing down. Uh, people are unable to pay their mortgages. And this is affecting a whole range of people in our, in our country. And those going through divorce proceedings are no more immune than anyone else to those uh, sorts of economic impacts. Now, the reason I've called my talk Variations, Valuations and Vitiations excuse the alliteration, is because what I have found uh, in my practice, both as I say, as a barrister and as a judge, the economic impacts of COVID are felt, first of all, in respect of, I'm going to slide on, first of all, in respect of job losses, I've talked about those, furlough, sudden income reductions, and that is acutely felt in respect of orders for maintenance. If there are orders for periodical payments, either made by the court or to be made by the court, Clearly, a significant decrease in income will have a, a, a serious impact on the ability to pay that. So that's the first one, maintenance, a variation of the first V. The second is valuing assets. The valuation of assets have plummeted, as we've already seen with these figures, during the course of this last year. Snapshot valuations undertaken by experts in the middle of divorce proceedings could be very different in March, May or June than they would have been the previous November. How do we deal with snapshot valuations in a moving market? The second V, valuations. And the third V, vitiations, is what about orders already made, which perhaps no longer seem as fair as they did? In other words, can orders ever be reopened? Can agreements, orders, orders primarily, not agreements, be vitiated? The third V, barter grounds. Those are what I'm going to talk, talk, uh, call my three major topics. They're the three main headings. And let's deal with the first of those now, maintenance, variation. Now, uh, I'm splitting up maintenance really into two subtopics. So there's variation generally, the court's approach to varying maintenance orders. But there's also a subtopic which is capitalization, replacing an ongoing order for maintenance with one single lump sum now and a clean break. No more maintenance, but it's replaced with a, a single lump sum. Let's talk about those separately. 
First of all, maintenance variation generally. Let's imagine that you are in a position where you're subject to an order for periodical payments, and now you find you can't afford it anymore. It's not at this, your income isn't at the same level. You've had a reduction because of your uh, because of COVID. Maybe you, you may have lost your job. You may have been placed on furlough. What can you do about it? Well, of all the topics I'm going to be talking about, this is perhaps the easiest to manage because maintenance, periodical payments, I'll use those terms interchangeably, maintenance obligations are inherently variable. It is an implicit part of an order for maintenance that it can be varied. The court has the jurisdiction, the power to vary orders for maintenance. The jurisdiction is found in section 31 of the Matrimonial Causes Act. And in deciding how to exercise the court's discretion, as, along with a whole host of um, factors the court has to look at, the court just had to examine all the circumstances of the case. So the application comes before the court, the court has to examine all the circumstances of the case. Part of those circumstances are, of course, the payer's ability to pay. Against that are going to be both parties' needs. Well, needs is a very broad term, and when assessing needs, uh, the court will find that needs are, or can work on the basis that needs are elastic, fact-specific, and highly discretionary. In other words, needs for one couple is very different to needs to another. One party's needs is another person's luxuries. Uh, when examining, if there were an application of variation, and I must say I've seen an increase in applications for variation, if there is a variation application brought before the court under Section 31 to revisit periodical payments, it does not mean the court has to undertake a complete forensic analysis of the party's finances. The court doesn't have to start again. What it does do is decide what's proportionate with the circumstances of that case. In other words, there need not be a root and branch forensic examination of the party's finances. The court's entitled to take what's known as a light touch approach. Ultimately, with the overriding objective in mind, with a view to trying to save costs and court time. Allied to that, in 2014, a fast track procedure was introduced into the procedural rules, meaning that if you bring a variation application before the court now, it is likely to be listed on this fast track procedure with an aim to getting these matters resolved quickly and at limited expense. However, that is not to say that going to court is ever cheap. It isn't. Litigating is expensive. And variation applications can very quickly become disproportionate. What, what do I mean by that? Well, let's say there is an argument as to whether or not maintenance should be more or less £100 a month. I think it should be £100 a month. Uh, my spouse said it should be £100 more. I mean, I'm taking a pretty extreme example. But clearly, it would not be proportionate to spend £10,000 or £20,000 arguing about that. And although variation applications are what are, is called no order as to costs applications, in other words, the assumption will be that at the end of the day, each will bear their own costs. There is something in the rules about this. And what, it says this, when the court decides whether to make any orders for costs, the court will have a view as to uh, the proportionality. Um, was it appropriate for someone to bring a matter before the court if the costs have become disproportionate? So you need to bear that in mind if you're seeking to apply to vary that it can be very expensive. And that may be one reason why you should utilize what Samantha was talking about, which is alternative dispute resolution, private FDRs, mediation, some other form. The second element of maintenance I was referring to was capitalization. What is capitalization? Well, it's very simple to conceptualize. An order is made that someone will pay 2000 pounds a month for 10 years. Capitalization simply replaces that order for maintenance with one lump sum and a clean break. The obligation to pay every month is removed, but in exchange, a large, usually large lump sum has to be paid. In COVID, perhaps it's not the best idea. It's not suited to unpredictable times. Why? Because capitalization crystallizes future risk. In other words, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but if you're capitalizing maintenance, you are wiping all that risk away and replacing it with one lump sum. In approaching capitalization, the court has to ask itself three questions. This comes from a case called Pearson Pierce. And those questions are, what variation should the court make? When should it start? And then what's the Duxbury figure? Some of you may be familiar with Duxbury, some of you may not. Take it from me, Duxbury is a range, a table of figures, which is designed from an actuarial perspective. Some actuaries may not agree, 
Carolyn Bailey's may take a view, how to replace a um, figure for maintenance with capital sum now. It's actually a hotly debated whether or not it's an appropriate index or not, but of course, a lot of went, went into it. In capitalizing, there are risks inherent for each party. From the payer's perspective, the payer says, well, I'm going to swap an order for periodical payments with, I'm making it up, 200,000 pounds. And then the payer thinks to himself or herself, but next month I could be made redundant. Should I really be paying a lump sum now to replace an ongoing income stream when actually this income stream might not be appropriate in a couple of months time? From the payee's perspective, the recipient's perspective, well, we might be capitalizing and temporarily reduced, depressed figure for income, which then uh, the payee may feel shortchanged if after COVID, um, the payer's income rockets up again. So there's risks on both sides. And I would suggest perhaps capitalization is not appropriate for um, a current uncertain market. Let's look at the valuation of assets. Um, pensions across the board have decreased in value. Caroline Bayliss is going to talk to you about that, but very briefly, this can mean an acute situation and a difficult situation if someone has a mixture of what are known as defined benefit and defined contribution pension schemes. One is affected much more by passive move, movements in the market, passive movements in the market than the other. If you have a mixture of those schemes, then sharing those pensions now may result in really unintended consequences in six months time if the economy fully recovers. You have to be very careful about valuing pensions now. But what I want to focus on is the valuation of private companies now, people owning shares in companies which they trade. Um, valuations of those companies are notoriously complex and difficult exercises to undertake. And COVID has only recently, uh, COVID has only acted to make that worse. But there's been a recent case, Mr. Justice Moston case of OG and AG, when the impact on COVID was explicitly referred to. I'm going to read very briefly from that judgment. What Mr. Justice Moston says is this, Unsurprisingly, both parties have put in statements recently dealing with the impact of the current global COVID-19 pandemic on the company, if any. It is an issue novel to this court, but one which likely will become a recurring feature in cases like this. And I think Mr Justice Moston is right. But how do we deal with the uh, difficulties with valuing a company in the middle of a COVID crisis? Well, the starting point is that valuations are inherently vulnerable. Uh, a, an accountant's valuation of a company is an art, not a science. Uh, it's a figure which has to be treated with a significant amount of caution because two different accountants will likely value a company very differently just because of the way they perhaps may approach the um, exercise. How do you deal with the risk inherent in the valuation of a company? Well, per Lord Justice Moylan and Martin, again, without wanting to send into the bill too much, there are three ways the court can take into account the valuation of a company. And each of those deals with risk in a different way. The first is, and perhaps this is most common in divorce cases, you fix a value in offsetting cash. So for example, if it's a wife's company, the court will say, well, I think this company is worth X pounds and therefore the wife will have to pay the husband half of X pounds, oops, before I destroy my room, half of X pounds in cash to offset the value of that. There's a danger with that because of course, is X pounds the correct figure? Well, given we have an inherently vulnerable valuation anyway by the nature of the exercise, you make it even more vulnerable in the middle of a COVID crisis. Should you really be doing this now, offsetting now, or should you wait until the economy stabilizes uh, and perhaps adjourn off or try and adjourn off the matter until we can revisit the valuation in six, 12 months, 18 months time? And if we're going to proceed now, how do we factor in COVID risk? Well, in that case of OG and AG I referred to, COVID risk was factored in, and also, interesting enough, Brexit risk was factored in by the court just, perhaps rough and ready, swiping 10% off the value of the company to reflect that risk. And the court has such a broad discretion, it can deal with that. But you may think, well, it's perhaps better to wait and see what happens. The second way the, com the court can deal with companies is the court could order the, the, the shares to be sold. And uh, that way, well, the risk is crystallized because the market will dictate what those shares are worth and that the value that is realized will be shared equally between the spouses. Therefore, no one loses or, or wins as a result of COVID crisis, or, or to put another way, they equally share that burden. But is it really often appropriate to take what's referred to as the goose that lays the golden eggs to market, to borrow a phrase from Mistresses Coleridge? It's a case that comes from a case called NNN. And I would say rarely it is. It's quite an extreme thing to do to order a company sold. Or the third, excuse the phrase, is share the shares. 
so that the shares in the private company is shared between, perhaps equally, perhaps not equally, perhaps in a clever way with the creation of different share categories, shared between husband and wife. But I say the rather obvious point there, does the court really want to leave divorced spouses as co-shareholders in a family company? It's, it's not a recipe for harmonious running of a company. Um, it may be, and I said earlier, it may be the best thing to do is just simply wait to see if the economy recovers. But that's also not without its difficulties. What are those difficulties? Let's talk about that briefly now. We wait, but how long do we wait for? Who has the crystal ball that will tell us when this pandemic will be over and the economy will recover? I don't have it, and if you do, I'd love to borrow it. What if the economy gets worse? We might actually just be waiting for things to get worse, not better. So who knows what the future holds? And another interesting question is, if the company increases in value as a result of the economy recovering, is there an argument that the shareholder spouse, the controlling spouse, the spouse who runs the company, is there an argument that they should be credited with the value of that increase? Um, one school of thought would say, well, if the company is just rising and falling with the market, it's not really anything other than passive factors in the, uh, in the market. And therefore, each should share the increase or the decrease in the value, because it's no more than a matrimonial asset rising and falling with value. On the other hand, what if you own a chain of cinemas and the cinema was about to go under, but for the fact that the wife who runs the cinema works 12 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, to ensure that the company didn't go under. And it's only as a result of her work solely that the company didn't go under. Well, maybe the recovery, a very large element of the recovery, is what we describe as matrimonial effort, uh, for which the spouse who put the effort in should be rewarded, and the spouse who didn't put the effort in, post-separation, shouldn't be rewarded. So difficulties there. Third topic, and I know I'm going quickly, but there's a lot to cover in a relatively short ground. The third V, vitiations. Is COVID a barter event? Some of you may know what barter is. Some of you may not know what barter is. Barter is the first important case. It's a House of Lords decision as to the circumstances in which the court can reopen and revisit an order for financial remedies, an order to sort out the finances from the divorce um, after the event. So the order is made, but the court's asked to revisit it. Those circumstances are very few and far between. We've already seen the court can vary maintenance. The court has no power to vary capital. So the only way you can revisit it is by asking the court to entirely reopen. And for obvious reasons, the courts are very, very reluctant to do this. But in Bard, Bard was a very unusual case, an awful case, where the assets were divided mostly to the wife in that case to meet the needs of her and her children. And shockingly, not long after the order was made, the wife killed the children and committed suicide. So an extreme and awful case. But ever since, people have been trying, lawyers have been trying to expand the boundaries of BARDA to fill larger and larger areas. What we know from BARDA, Lord Brandon, is there are four conditions before you can revisit an order. Number one, there must be a new event which invalidates the very basis on which the order was made. In BARDA, the wife got most of the assets to meet her needs and the children. Those needs sadly didn't exist any longer. Two, they must have occurred within a relatively short time of the order being made. Three, the application needs to be made reasonably promptly. And fourthly, any application must not prejudice third parties have acquired in good faith uh, any interests which it's being sought to assert should be revisited. Bada was about shocking death. What about change in values, subsequent change in values of Bada event? Well, repeatedly, the authorities have told us that changes in values are not Bada events, which may make you feel that COVID is not a good reason to reopen, but we'll come on to that. First, in the case of Cornick, there was a dramatic increase in the value of shares, not a decrease in increase. Her Mrs. Justice Hale, as she then was, there are three categories of value case. The first is where an asset's correctly valued at trial, but after trial, the value changes due to the natural process of price fluctuation. The court should absolutely not allow the order to be revisited. Parties take on risk and reward when they share assets between them, and the court divides risk and reward when it divides assets between them. Simply because an asset turns out to be risky or rewarding is no more than the natural consequence of that. You shouldn't be able to revisit on that basis. But secondly, the wrong value was put on at trial by mistake, perhaps. And had the court known, it would have made a different order. The appeal can succeed if the person who's seeking to revisit it was not at fault in that wrong valuation. I say could. This isn't you could. You can. This is just the door may be open. Or thirdly, something unforeseen and unforeseeable has happened. 
Mr Justice Hale tells us these are few and far between. The question for us is COVID unforeseen and unforeseeable, or is the economic consequences of COVID natural process of price fluctuation? The application failed in Cornick. I've already explained why, because an increase in value of shares was entirely predictable. In Myerson, there was a decrease in value of shares. Application failed. In Maskell, the husband lost his job. Application failed. Why? Because people lose their jobs all the time. Even the most secure of jobs can be removed with very little notice. There is no prospect, there's no reasonable expectation that you have a job for life. Loss of a job, application failed. Again, maybe relevant to COVID. S and S, slightly differently because S and S was, the question S and S was, was the case of White and White a Barda event? Well, in that case, the application failed, but three propositions were raised. First, the new event must be a complete change of circumstances and not a development of facts which we're already known about. Unforeseeable means not envisaged and could not reasonably have been envisaged. And thirdly, if the events could, could have been ascertained with diligent inquiry, in other words, if you'd actually made the effort to look into it, then the application will not succeed. Simply because you didn't look hard enough or you were blinkered to the possibility doesn't mean you can um, revisit. Willful ignorance is, is not a, a, a remedy. So to, to finish, let's answer the question for COVID. Let's go through our questions. Is the economic impact of COVID a subsequent event? Well, I can't answer that question because that depends on the case you're involved in. If a case was settled in March, then I suspect COVID-19 was not a subsequent event. It was all over the headlines. If a case settled in January, maybe it is. If a case settled in November, maybe it is. If a case settled in November 2017, I suspect it can't possibly be because too much time has passed. But if it was November 19 or December 19, perhaps. Is the economic impact of COVID-19 unforeseen and unforeseeable? Well, I might get a little bit technical here, not for long, very briefly, but I'd suggest there are perhaps two different ways of looking at it. And what does unforeseen and unforeseeable mean? Well, it doesn't mean literally incapable of being imagined, because as Mr Justice Mostyn, whose name has appeared a few times in this seminar, uh, said in a case called DB and DJ, the question is not whether a future event is literally incapable of being imagined. The capacity of, of homo sapiens to imagine fictive things is vast. The question is, in fact, could it reasonably have been predicted or reasonably could not have been predicted? That's the phrase, reasonably could not have been predicted. Well, argument against COVID-19 being unforeseen. Global fluctuations occur regularly. The economy is cyclical. There are rises, there are falls. I don't think the banking crisis could have been said to be unforeseen and unforeseeable. Um, and on that same basis, why should this current economic fluctuation be any different? We are in turbulent waters. The economy is a rough sea. No one said it was smooth sailing. Why should this be any different? Um, that's not argument against. How about argument for COVID-19 being unforeseen and unforeseeable? All these previous events that I've referred to, banking crisis, um, the Icelandic banking crisis, subprime mortgage crisis, these were all caused by actors inside the economy. It was people who work in the economy that caused it to um, vary in the way it did. COVID-19 is an external actor, strange phrase, but it's an external influence on the economy. Is it perhaps unforeseen and unforeseeable because something external happened? I don't know, perhaps. Um, I remember when that volcano erupted in Iceland and it uh, impacted on flights. Would that have been a barter event if you owned a, fl uh, a, a flight company? I don't know, perhaps. It's difficult to say. Uh, my gut feeling is I think it'd be very difficult to argue that COVID-19 is a barter event, but some people disagree with me. And finally, does the economic impact of COVID-19 invalidate the basis on which the order was made? Well, again, I think that depends on the facts of the case. So if a company is just slightly reduced in value, or even significantly reduced in value, again, that's a risk which is known when you take on shares. I think that will be difficult. Um, if, however, we'll go back to our cinema chain, you owned a cinema chain, and then suddenly, as of March, nobody going to the cinema anymore. So it's not just a slight change in, in, in the value of the company or the, the company moving generally with the markets. This is a very specific problem. No one's going to the cinema anymore. My cinema chain collapses. Is that a barter, is that a, a barter event, as a result of which um, invalidates the base on which the order was made? Well, perhaps it is, because perhaps the court didn't imagine that everyone would suddenly stop going to the cinema as of March, so maybe. 
but it's dependent, I think, on each and every case. As I say, my gut feeling is I think it'd be very difficult to argue that COVID-19 is a viral event, but not necessarily impossible. Um, so those are my three topics, uh, variations, valuations and vitiations. And at the end, I'd really love to hear all of your thoughts, questions and discussions about the impact of a plummeting economy or a plummeted economy on financial remedy proceedings. And now uh, I'm going to pass over to Caroline Bayliss, who is an actuary. She's going to be telling you all about the impact of COVID-19 on pensions. Pensions are a thorny and difficult topic at the best of times, but I know Caroline will make it seem uh, very simple because when I hear her, I always get the distinct impression that it's, um, although it might be very complicated behind the scenes, she has a wonderful way of telling you all about it. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can, I can vouch for make it, making it perfectly simple, but I will um, at least keep it, keep it brief, which is, is almost sometimes just, just as good. Um, so as Sam said, um, I'm from Excalibur Actuaries. We're a boutique actuarial consultancy where we specialise on pensions and divorce um, uh, reports. So if we can move to the next slide. Yes, we're all here to talk about COVID-19 um, and the effect on family finances, but I'm afraid we're going to need a little revision uh, first because um, I'm going to uh, make, make, make the assumption that you're, you're not all um, in touch with pensions every, every, all day, every day, uh, like I am. So I'm just going to give you a little basis um, for, for what I'm talking about. So if we could move to the next slide. We're going to just do a, a couple of minutes on a pensions 101. Um, and the reason for that is that there are two very different um, sorts of styles of pension schemes, which have acted very, reacted very differently to, to COVID. So the first type is defined benefit, used to be known as final salary. Um, and this is the sort of the, the old fashioned pension scheme, if you like, where you, you, you worked for 40 years for your company and you got a pension for life and then your spouse got a pension after you died and it pays on and on. And there's lots of rules of coming around how you have to treat these in um, over the years. Um, it'll increase before you retire. If you've left the company, it'll increase after you retire. Both of those to keep up with them. Um, inflation and, and the like um, they're not all the same they might you might be able to retire at different ages um, uh, and, and the provisions for the actual amount of pension and things like increases will will be different depending on um, the actual nature of the scheme um, defined contribution schemes or, money, or also known as money purchase schemes are a very different beast and these sort of started coming into into vogue in in the 90s really when the defined benefit schemes just got became a bit too expensive uh, for companies to to provide people were living for longer so a pension for life was costing the company more the company's underwriting the pension on a defined benefit scheme and actually the the returns were, were, were lower or matched returns were lower so it or the cost was just spiraling out of control and and certainly um uh, back in the day, we, we certainly used to run um, some defined benefit schemes where the scheme was actually worth more than the company. Um, that's, that's how out of whack some of these things have got. But with a defined contribution um, arrangement, you put some money into a, into a pensions pot, maybe with an insurance company or, or the company will run the pot themselves. The company will put some money into that. And then basically, when you get to retirement, you can choose when you when you retire for as, as far as the, the pot of money is concerned, what your outcome is, it depends on the investment return that you've, you've had over, over the period. So what the pot of money is looking like at the time you come to retire, um, how, how, it, how it will last will depend on how, how long you live. Um, so there is a risk of um, outliving your pension pot uh, and you can choose the, um, the add-ons that you want. So if you don't have a spouse, you don't need to, pay for a spouse's pension, whereas you might want increases in payment at a higher rate, for example. So those are the two different sorts of pensions, and actually they behave very differently um, during COVID. So I'm going to move on now to the simpler one of the two, if we can go to the next slide, that's the defined contribution, because as Ben gave you lots of uh, great numbers about it. And this is, a, this is a slide for those of you who are a bit more visual thinkers than, than oral thinkers, maybe. Um, <clears throat> he talked about how the 
values of the stock market had gone down and down. And here you can see a sort of pictorial representation of it with them, um, you know, fund values going down by around 35% between um, January and the, and the late, late March. They've come back a bit, having a bit of a wobble at the moment as well. So, um, so obviously some of that is, is you know, uh, just typical day to day, but you can see that that, that cliff edge there has impacted um, money purchase defined contribution schemes quite quite dramatically. Now, you can't necessarily say the same um, for defined benefit. So if we could just move on to the next slide, because that's got a lot of different impacts. So maybe um, we might see increased mortality in the, in, in the future. Um, now, probably probably not based on, on, on where, where we are so far. You know, obviously, there has been an increased mortality. Um, but it's not sort of dramatic in the schemes of population mortality. Um, that may have, that may make the cost of the defined benefit less lower. The assets backing it may have decreased, um, but actually, in some assets backing COVID will have increased if if the scheme is 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 matching to its liabilities. So the cost of the benefits might have increased, and that would actually serve to increase your transfer value rather than decrease it. On the other hand, if a scheme uh, and a company is, is feeling things are getting a bit tight, they might be risk removing discretionary benefits. So some schemes um, might allow for um, pension increases over and above what, what is guaranteed under the scheme uh, in their transfer. Values. They might move that. They might remove all those little um, add-ons that, that they have, that they have um, just, just to make the scheme more, more stable. And of course, What's been mentioned several times before is that the companies are becoming maybe coming insolvent. Now, uh, for for those of you who who are as old as me can remember Mirror Group newspapers um, going becoming insolvent, um, and the pension scheme uh, actually having been been raided. Um, it's not such a disaster these days um, as as it was in those days. That 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 case. Um, created a whole infrastructure around insolvency and um, pension funds. And so what we do have now is in extreme case, there is a, a body called the Pension Protection Fund um, that will take over a pension scheme and effectively become the insurer's last resort. It's, it's funded by, by a levy on, on all the uh, non-insolvent pension schemes. So even if the company becomes insolvent, there is likely to be some protection uh, for the pension, um, but you will find that if the company goes into the pension protection fund, that the benefits will be reduced to 90% of what they were before. There's limits on things, uh, on the amount of pension, um, and there may be changes to, to um, the inflation protection that's required. So it's not all doom and gloom if the company goes insolvent, but it could actually impact on, on your transfer value in, a, in a quite a material way. Um, and of course, the other the other part about that is that while the scheme is in that sort of nether world between insolvency or administration and actually going into the pension protection fund, there's a bit of a hiatus where where really nobody knows too much about what's what's going on. The the the, the, the trustees are, are feverishly trying in the background to work out what you know how much they can afford, can they afford to run it. Um, uh, independently without having to go into the pension protection fund and that could just really just slow things down uh, an awful lot. So to move on then what does that mean for pension splitting? Um, so the the main ways of, of, of uh, sharing sharing a pension or splitting a pension um, just to go over these very quickly for anybody who's not entirely familiar Earmarking or attachment is, is if you like, the, the one that's least affected by this because in, in that um, methodology, the um, individual um, will just pay, a, pen, a portion of their pension will be paid over to the spouse. Um, now, the, the downside of that, uh, um, one of the many, the, the many downsides of that are that the, the, the spouse can only get the pension once the member starts taking their own pension. So they could delay it or they could bring it forward, um, which would reduce the value, value of the pension being split because it was um, being paid uh, for a longer period and then therefore reduced to take account of that. 
um, it stops when the when the spouse remarries. It stops when the the member um, dies. Uh, it, it's you know possibly the antithesis to a, a clean clean break approach, and and we certainly don't don't see very many of those. Um, share, pension sharing is is um, going to be impacted by uh, the the change in values for COVID. But unfortunately, as as a as a true actuary, it's it's afraid it's a little bit of a you know an I de it depends sort of outcome you can't really say what um, impact it's going to have until you actually see the the pensions involved and, and how they've changed um, one piece of good news uh, is that where you've got public sector pension schemes um, they will share the pension by providing the spouse with a pension inside the scheme on the same basis as as they um, value the pension. So actually, as far as in, um, sharing on public sector schemes is concerned, there's, there's been no change yet. The CTVs haven't changed. It's an enormous job to, to change the, the valuation basis. And I haven't heard any whispers of that happening just yet, um, but never say never. Um, but the, the pension is is brought in for the for the spouse on the same basis so if you've got just public sector schemes then there's then there's no change and you can at least there's one element where you can go ahead with confidence the other way is offsetting um i think ben's talked a lot about the the you know the ways that valuations of shares and and so on have, have um have impacted um but obviously if you're realizing shares to to, to cr uh, create the offsetting pay the offsetting amount then there's there's likely to be uh, an impact on, on you there um so as i say that's a very quick whiz through um uh, pensions and, and covid um hopefully hasn't uh, uh sent anybody to, to sleep just yet I, I i appreciate this 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 can be a bit dry for 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 solicitors um so just i'll hand back to sam for questions and wind up uh, thanks very much, Caroline. Actually, I found your talk very accessible and very easy to follow. So thank you, uh, because it can be a minefield for solicitors <laughs> to get their heads around the different types of pension schemes and how they might be affected. Um, we've had a question in, Caroline, to ask um, whether or not you've had any experience of having to produce a report when a pension has been put into a pension protection fund. Uh, yes, we, we do them reasonably frequently. Um, what tends to happen in that case is the the pension protection fund will offer the men uh, the spouse an internal credit so a bit like i was talking about how public sector um, schemes work um but typically you'll it well a it slows the, the process down an, an awful lot and um you know b there's not particularly usually any advantage in in, in doing that so quite often the other pension and other pensions will be will be shared in, in preference Okay, thank you. Um, ben hasn't rejoined us at the moment, so I'm going to carry on some <laughs> questions. Oh, here, he, there he is. He's uh, magically appeared. Um, ben, um, I've just had a question in about um, whether or not you've had actually an experience of people applying um, for you as either a private FDR judge or as an, uh, do you sit as an arbitrator? Are you not trained as an arbitrator? No, no, I, don't, I, I don't do arbitration. Okay, so sitting as a private FDR, FDR judge to actually yeah. deal with. Um, the question of variation how you know how does that differ how would you apply for that in terms of because normally when we have a private fdr it's when we're in the course of normal financial relief type proceedings how do they go about applying for that and have you had much experience of it well i've done plenty of private fdrs both as a barrister and as a private fdr judge um and uh, you don't have to be in proceedings to have a private fdr in fact it might be sensible that the parties aren't in proceedings there'd need to be a full exchange of financial information beforehand of course uh, so is this for a variation? Sorry to be clear, is this for variations? Yeah, for variations, absolutely. Okay. There needs to be a full exchange of financial information. Um, the parties need to be in a position where they can negotiate. It's pointless, of course, coming for a private FDR, which is, by definition, an attempt to try and resolve the case. Um, they need to be in a position where the parties have had negotiations, are able to negotiate. But if they feel that they're able to negotiate, then in fact, what you're utilizing, and there's a big crossover, very, they're very similar concept. What you're really having is this early neutral evaluation, very similar concept. Yes. You come before someone like me, set out the various competing arguments. And I say, look, you can take this to, to court. You can issue your form A, you can spend your 10, 20,000 pounds, but I actually think the answer is probably this. And uh, in my experience, it's, it's 
a lot of the time people just want to be told what the answer is. There's so much uncertainty yes. in this area of the law. There's a huge value in someone independent coming in and saying, I could be wrong, but if I was dealing with this, I think the answer is X. And that gives a huge pressure, I think, and uh, an impetus on people to settle. So I've found them very helpful indeed. Yeah, the answer to your question. Yeah, I think it's interesting, but I think a lot of practitioners will think of private FDRs just for the normal course of negotiating an overall financial settlement, but not necessarily dealing with nuances such as variations and getting an opinion on that. And as you say, it can be so disproportionate when you're dealing with a variation of maintenance. Somebody wants to reduce it, I don't know, by 500 pounds a month, and yeah. suddenly you're spending thousands of going through a court process. I think that could be a very good way of getting to a quicker resolution. The two um, obvious Caroline. Ways, sorry, I was just going to say the two obvious sorry. ways of variation would be I would send them straight to mediation or private FDR. I think the last op option would be to issue Form A. I think that's the worst thing to do in many, many cases. Okay, thank you. Caroline, what can we do as practitioners to make our instructions to you better? So I know you get these standard joint letter of instructions and we send you standard documents. So is there anything that we can do to uh, get the information to you in a better format? Yeah, it's, it's not a specifically COVID, COVID related um, issue, but um, what we do always need is, is up to date information. Now, you know, certainly I've, I've had calls recently to say to somebody, look, the valuation you've sent me of your defined contribution pension is, is from November. You might want to go and get something a bit more up to date. I can make an estimate, um, but obviously, depending on what you're actually invested in, um, that may have uh, acted differently depending on which sector of the economy is, is it's based in um but generally just you know up to up to date information um and particularly if you're asking to refence something for a marriage period get get hold of either a, a schedule of the contributions paid or a service a service history that can take forever and certainly with some administrators having gone down to skeleton staff it can be taking you even longer uh, particularly where you've got a complex service history and um, we often see that in things like the NHS where people have moved around a lot and had different part-time full-time service work while they've been out in private practice and so on so getting hold of that information early is probably the thing that you that, that uh, practitioners could do uh, that would help us the most and well, I often, because Ben and I will have a lot of people seeking to ring fence parts of their pen say that they were um built up prior to cohabitation and then marriage. And so it'd be useful to get those schedule of payments ahead of um, instructing if there's some sort of dispute over what part should be ring fenced out. Yeah, I mean, quite often people will, will um, ask me to ring fence things with, with no guidance as to how, how to ring fence them. So um, either, either that or, 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 or some, you know, guidance that says, these five pensions were all accrued before marriage and we, we both agree that, then then that makes that makes life easy. But um, yes, I, no, I'm not, not psychic. <laughs> <laughs> I've got you're very popular at the moment um Caroline I've got two, uh, two further questions for you how common is it for the value of defined pension scheme to be worth more than the value shown in a statement CETV issue is relevant to whether an actuary's report should be obtained assuming the value of the pension is never less than the statement which reflects the CETV I would say it's probably in about 95% of cases, the value that we would put on the pension is higher than what the CTV is. Um, right. I mean, typically for public sector pensions, um, it's about two thirds of the, the CTV is about two thirds of the value that we would we would put on it. Um, and the other thing right. to remember is that the CTV is something that is based on the scheme actuaries, um, personal interpretation of economic conditions. Um, so okay. they might have different views of mortality, of future inflation, all of which go in to make the value of the CTV. Um, and so the way we do it is we will put all of those onto a consistent basis so that we're actually saying a £10,000 a year pension in, in Scheme A is worth the same as a £10,000 a year pension in Scheme B, whereas actually the CTVs could be very different. Okay, and the other question we've had in is, have you got any experience of the impact of COVID upon final salary schemes in the reports you've been preparing? Um, well, as, as, I, as I said, it, it's, it's, very, it's, variable, it's variable depending on, on the nature of the scheme. We've had some schemes where the CTVs have gone up quite, um, quite dramatically. Um, and we've had some where they, they, they've, moved, they've moved in the other, in the other direction. So I'm afraid it's a really, it, it, it does depend an awful, an awful lot on how generous the CTV was before 
um, if, if it was generous before, then they might be stripping out all those little margins. Um, but depend, it, it really does depend, I'm afraid, which is, I'm afraid, as I said before, it's a true actuary's answer. Um, just one final question before we close this webinar. Uh, ben, uh, one of the questions we've had is how, what is the best way for solicitors to identify um, a possible FDR judge or arbitrator? How, what's the way that they can go about identifying somebody? Ask around, <laughs> word of mouth. There's no better way than if you speak to someone you know who's had a private FDR before. What did you think of your private FDR judge? Did you like them or not? Um, I, I think that's, that's, the, that's the best answer I can give. So really, so is it worth us contacting different sets of chambers, finding out who is available to do this and then just pushing forward some names and CVs? Yeah, of course. And has it been more cost effective in your business um, for private FDRs and arbitration? Because I know the cost of hiring a judge in a venue, as well as potentially hiring barristers and solicitors to attend a day, can be cost prohibitive or put people off. Do you actually find it's more cost neutral than people else? I don't think it's cost neutral. I think it's an absolute benefit. Um, the difference between having a private FDR with a single judge to deal with your matter all day compared to going to court when you're in a list of six, seven cases in one day in front of a Harris judge who might not be an expert in the field. You might be in front of a deputy who's a conveyancer when they're not doing this. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's a huge benefit. Um, far more cases settle, in my experience, a private FDR than a court-based FDR. Far more. So it's certainly worth right. it. Well, so it's worth the investment to get the case, the, the right result, the right outcome, and having somebody actually focus on you for the day who's got experience of this. Um, I do have another question, but we really are out of time now, I'm afraid. So we will come back to that question in the question and answer pamphlet. Um, I just want to close by thanking my two brilliant speakers today, Caroline and Ben. Thank you for your presentations. Really interesting and a very important topic and very relevant to um, the current climate we find ourselves in. I want to remind you that there is a recording of this webinar and indeed all our family law webinars. This particular recording will be uploaded onto our website at the beginning of next week. Um, our webinars um, for our previous family law webinars are already on our website. In addition, the materials you've seen today and the question and answers will also go onto the website at the beginning of next week. As I said um, at the beginning of this, this is the final one of uh, this tranche of family law webinars. But we're really interested at DMH Standard on making these webinars relevant to you. So please do let us know what you would like us to present on for the next three webinars, which we will be conducting next year, hopefully in the early part of next year, so that we make sure they are tailor-made to meet your needs. So again, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in today and joining us, and in particular thanking my two Wonderful speakers, Caroline and Ben. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and thank you on behalf of BMH Stallard.